how we treat children leaves a deep imprint in our minds all through our lives. But I can never forget that day in school when I was caned on my hand what was my offense for not bringing the right size needle to class for a craftwork project? And I still remember pleading with my teacher to cane me on my bum instead of my hand and the teacher insisted on caning on my hand. I was too ashamed to go home and tell my parents that my hand was ringing in pain. And I suffered that pain for the, la for the next 10 days. But that left an imprint on my hand and on my heart and soul which continues even today in the work which I do. So deep is the imprint of the travesties which we face as children. At the outset, I would like to thank the Chief Justice and Justice Anand Mohan Bhattarai, as well as the Indian Embassy for facilitating my visit to Nepal for this very significant event. Both our societies are predominantly societies which are reaping the demographic dividend. We are societies of young people. And what better occasion then for me to be in this beautiful country than to speak about children who represent the future of our societies. I, op I applaud at the outset the Supreme Court of Nepal, the Secretariat of the Child Justice Committee and UNICEF Nepal for putting together a symposium of immense promise and relevance. This symposium is not just a forum for discourse, but a testament to our shared dedication to safeguarding the rights and well-being of children, who undoubtedly represent the future, the future of innovation, growth, and humanity. In that sense, when we focus on juvenile justice, we are investing towards the future of our own societies. Children enter the world with a clean slate. Universally, we acknowledge the innocence of children as integral to their being and conduct. But when a child encounters the legal system, it prompts society to introspect on the underlying systemic issues that may have driven the child to commit a crime. As a population group, children are also the most disenfranchised and susceptible to oppression. These factors necessitate a sensitive and reform-oriented approach to children in conflict with the law, as well as child victims of various crimes. The concept of advocating for a distinct and special form of justice for children and teenagers represents a relatively recent development in the annals of civilization and legal administration. During the mid-19th century, significant strides were made towards establishing a separate system for dealing with juveniles. This included restructuring the role of magisterial courts in handling offenses involving juveniles and establishing reformatories and schools, industrial schools. Throughout the latter half of the 19th century, various institutions were created to supervise delinquent juveniles with reform schools becoming prevalent in several jurisdictions. The establishment of Bostel schools in various states across India is one such development. Bostel schools are corrective institutions which adopt a reformative approach towards adolescent offenders. But at the heart of the development of juvenile justice lies the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the CRC, of 1989 a cornerstone document that every country in South Asia has ratified. The CRC is a successor of the UN Standard Minimum Rules for the Administration of Juvenile Justice of 1985, the Beijing Rules as they were called. These conventions prescribe the minimum standards for handling juvenile delinquents. The focus is not only on the post-conviction treatment of the juvenile, the emphasis is rather on ensuring that the process of criminal justice from the initial contact with the police and prosecution is altered to suit the needs of juveniles. The establishment of a distinct juvenile justice system is a duty cast on the state in persons of its parents' patria jurisdiction. The parents' patria jurisdiction casts a threefold duty on the state. First, this philosophy emphasizes handling juvenile matters informally 
and grants juvenile courts the authority to decide what is best for young offenders. Second, it advocates for compassionate and rehabilitative treatments rather than punitive measures, aiming to avoid the negative consequences of labeling that can arise from formal court proceedings. Thirdly, it involves state intervention to shape the life outcomes of juveniles, reflecting a belief that traditional criminal law processes are just not suited to effectively address juvenile delinquency and related issues. Now, when discussing juvenile justice, we have to recognize the vulnerabilities and unique needs of children embroiled in legal conflicts and ensure that our justice systems respond with empathy, rehabilitation, and opportunities for reintegration into society. It is crucial to grasp the multifaceted nature of juvenile justice and its intersections with various dimensions of our societies. Children are often driven towards delinquent behavior by complex societal challenges like economic disparities and social inequalities, family breakdowns resulting from issues like domestic violence or poverty can leave children without the necessary guidance, making them more susceptible to negative influences. There's a film in 2017 called The Florida Project, in which a young child, Muni, navigates her childhood in the shadow of economic hardship, residing with her single mother in a budget motel. As a mother grapples with personal obstacles, Muni finds herself navigating the harsh realities of poverty largely on her own. The film tenderly portrays the impact of familial instability on children, shedding light on the delicate interplay between economic disparity, social inequity, and familial bonds. Practices like child marriage and labor may deprive children of their childhoods, exposing them to exploitation and abuse further heightening the risk of delinquency. I would now like to briefly embark on a comparative journey between Nepal and India's juvenile justice systems. In both Nepalese and Indian societies, children, as we know, are revered and loved as a future and are considered to be the heart of the family unit. Both cultures place a strong emphasis on education, moral upbringing and protection of children's rights. The challenges and issues faced by children in conflict with the law transcend our national boundaries and borders, highlighting the need for a coordinated and holistic approach to juvenile justice. Both our countries have a shared commitment to international conventions and treaties aimed at safeguarding the rights of children, such as the CRC. Nepal was among the first countries to ratify the CRC in 1990. Subsequently, Nepal enacted its ju initial juvenile law, the Children's Act in 1992, which was enacted to protect the rights and interests of children for the physical, mental, and intellectual development of our children. After nearly three decades, the enactment of the Act relating to children in 2018 marked a significant milestone repla replacing the two 1992 law. This legislation raised the minimum age of children from 16 to 18 in Nepal, aligning with the UN Convention standards and introduce provisions ensuring that children under 18 are not held criminally liable for acts committed against the law. Likewise, in India, we have been making consistent efforts to evolve with our juvenile justice system. India enacted its first Juvenile Justice Act in 1986, which was replaced by the Juvenile Justice Act of 2000, which was again subsequently replaced by the Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act 2015 in a need for a more robust and practical justice framework focusing on reformative approaches. The Act of 2015 embodies a holistic approach, emphasizing the special needs and vulnerabilities of juveniles and prioritizing their rehabilitation and reintegration into society. The implementation of various juvenile justice legislations for around four decades in India has led to the establishment of facilities, structures, and systems addressing children's needs within the protection system. But so much remains to be done still, which I'll come to later. I will now de delve into three aspects of juvenile justice 
touched upon by our legislations in India and Nepal. The first principle is related to the process and the rights of a child during a criminal trial. That's the first aspect I want to deal with. In this regard, shifting our focus from debating whether juveniles should be tried as adults to understand the circumstances that drive children to commit crimes is crucial. As we develop the ability to distinguish between the right and wrong, it becomes our commitment to foster the right kind of behavior. While children may make wrong decisions during their developmental journey, they do not merit the same treatment as fully grown adults. Therefore, child delinquency is not met with the same severity. Instead, juveniles are sent to special detention centers where they can comprehend the impact of their actions on society and have the opportunity to rectify them. But how we treat children leaves a deep imprint in our minds all through our lives. I can never forget the day in school. I was not a juvenile delinquent, but I can never forget the day in school when I was caned on my hand, what was my offense for not bringing the right size needle to class for a craft work project? And I still remember pleading with my teacher to cane me on my bum instead of my hand and the teacher insisted on caning on my hand. I was too ashamed to go home and tell my parents that my hand was ringing in pain. And I suffered that pain for the, la for the next 10 days with the marks which I would constantly try and hide from everyone at home. But that left an imprint on my hand and on my heart and soul, which continues even today in the work which I do. So deep is the imprint of the travesties which we face as children. In Nepal, investigative authorities promptly respond to reports of offenses, initiating inquiries and taking children into custody only when necessary, because that's the mandate of the law in Nepal as well. Throughout investigation, Children have to be provided with psychological counseling and support to ensure their well-being. Although the juvenile justice court may resort to placing accused children in reform homes under specific circumstances, they maintain various rights throughout trials, including access to information, legal aid, trial by competent authorities, family presence, prompt justice, confidentiality, and a child-friendly environment. Section 31 of the Act Relating to Children of 2018 and Rule 18 of the Administration of Child Justice Procedure Regulation 2019 define the jurisdiction of the child bench, emphasizing rehabilitation over detention. This framework in Nepal permits parental care instead of juvenile reform homes in specific cases. We have to be careful in not sending every child who is guilty of an infraction of law to a special institution. Parental reform and parental supervision may be the best answer in a large number of cases. I was reading the concept note and found that the Supreme Court of Nepal recently issued a mandamus order for the establishment of a children's court in Kathmandu. It was in Ajay Shankar Jha versus Nepal government et al. on 24th of October 2023. This is truly commendable as it becomes evident that the country is actively advancing its juvenile justice system, prioritizing the holistic well-being and rehabilitation of children. Similarly, in India, the Juvenile Justice Act lays down provisions for the care and protection of children in conflict with the law. Juvenile justice boards and child welfare committees are established at the district and sub-district levels to handle cases of children in conflict with the law and children in need of care and protection. The Act also provides for the establishment of specialized homes for juvenile offenders and mandates the involvement of trained professionals in their rehabilitation progress. Through the Act of 2015, juveniles between the ages of 16 and 18 have been now permitted in India to be tried as adults, particularly following the heinous Nirbhaya rape case, in certain circumstances for heinous crimes like rape and murder. Yet the focus on the fundamental principle of rehabilitation and reintegration remains unchanged. Both countries in their legislation have ensured children's rights to visits, correspondence and telephone calls with families and others with full respect for privacy. Placement in adult prisons is strictly prohibited except in designated separate wings. Section 11.3 
of the Nepal Children's Act emphasizes privacy rights requiring that personal information about victim or accused children as well as details of actions taken against them remain confidential. Any publication or dissemination of such information which would cause harm or embarrass the child is strictly prohibited through the justice process. The second aspect which I want to emphasize is the principle of the best interest of the child. Section 3 of the Juvenile Justice Act in India which states that all decisions regarding the child shall be based on the primary consideration that they are in the best interest of the child and to help the child to develop full potential. This is mirrored in Section 16.1 of the Children Act of Nepal. Additionally, principles such as involving child or children in decision-making processes, ensuring their safety and recognizing the importance of family responsibility are integral to ensuring the holistic well-being of children. The principle of non-stigmatizing semantics emphasizes the use of language that respects the dignity and the rights of children, refraining from labeling or stigmatizing them based on their circumstances or actions. Too very often, the approach towards a child is, Tu to bachcha hai, tu to bachchi hai. What we fail to understand is that they may not have an agency strictly speaking in the law because they are not yet 18 but they have a mind of their own and it is important that as judges, as lawyers, as social workers, we must recognize the agency of the child. I was reading about a case by the Supreme Court of Nepal in Advocate Pushparaj Pordel versus Sindhuli District Court of 2023, which emphasized the prompt resolution of juvenile cases within the prescribed timeline of 102 days. I feel that prioritizing the swift resolution of such cases aims to minimize any potential harm or trauma experienced by juvenile offenders and ensures their access to prompt justice and rehabilitation. The third principle which I want to dwell on of juvenile justice is restorative justice. Restorative justice is an approach that recognizes the multifaceted impact of crime on the victim, the community and the offender. Its primary objective is to repair the harm caused by the offense, facilitate reparation to both the community and the victim, and facilitate the offender's reintegration into the community as a productive member. Reskilling these young offenders. In the Indian context, the Juvenile Justice Act outlines various rehabilitation and reintegration measures for children in the conflict with law, such as counseling, education, vocational training and community service. The aim is to mitigate stigmatization and provide opportunities for juveniles to reintegrate into society as responsible citizens. For instance, a juvenile offender involved in a minor theft is directed to participate in a community service program where they can help and clean local parks. Now I would like to briefly deal with the challenges relating to juvenile justice. I would like to highlight some of the more recent instances where sometimes the adequacies or inadequacies of the juvenile justice system is played out in India. In a recent case before the Supreme Court of India, a petition reached its final stage, the curative stage. As you know, in India, we have developed the curative jurisdiction so that even after the appeal is dismissed and a review is dismissed, you can still have access to the court on limited grounds. The petitioner had been incarcerated as a minor on the offense of murder under section 302 of the penal code and had spent decades behind bars. The highest court recognized the failure of the system, ordered an investigation and eventually it was found that the offender was a juvenile on the date of the commission of the offense. Now what happens in such cases is that these offenders who have spent decades behind bars belong to the poorest of our communities. They belong to the most marginalized of our groups. They don't have qualified legal assistance. As a result of which there's a grave danger that years later they may be sentenced to imprisonment for life or even in a given case a sentence of death. We have in India a project called Project 39 which has been sponsored by the National Law University of Delhi and in all cases involving the sentence of death, the National Law University steps into the court and gives assistance as an amicus curiae, 
as a friend of the court and you'll be surprised at the number of cases where convictions have been reversed in the exercise of the curative jurisdiction and the court has ordered the acquittal of the accused or at the least a sentence of death has been remitted to a sentence of imprisonment for life. We have to, we have to therefore ask hard questions in our societies. If these errors are possible in the criminal justice system, we as legal professionals have to be very careful in protecting the rights particularly of children. This showcases that the highest court possesses the authority to influence the juvenile justice system, transcending the purview traditionally held by juvenile justice boards. Our law says that an inquiry into whether a person was a juvenile on the date of the offence is permissible at any stage. Just yesterday, two of my colleagues found that a person was in fact a minor on the date of the offence. So what we do typically is to call forth a report from the district judge or the sessions judge who had conducted the sessions trial or their successor. They will record evidence including the birth certificate, the panchayat certificate, a whole host of certificates and render a finding. We do of course get some cases of abuse of law where certificates may be forged. They may be fabricated to secure release, but our sessions judges are obviously robust and they have a great deal of experience and they tell us, no, this person was not a juvenile on the date of the offence. But so also, there are a large number of cases where it emerges that they were off juvenile offenders, in which case they have to be released forthwith after having undergone imprisonment for 15 years, sometimes 20 years. So, the point of the matter, therefore, I want to emphasize is juvenile justice is not confined solely to the dictates of the Juvenile Justice Act, but is rather shaped by the intricate interplay of various legislative enactments. A recent case which came before me personally just a few weeks ago, and in fact the last of it this week, brought before the Supreme Court of India, exemplifies this. A 14-year-old young girl who is alleged to be a victim of rape sought permission to terminate her pregnancy under the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act of 1971. The Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act of 1971 is one of the most forward-looking legislations that we have in India as compared to what some of the legislations even in the Western world are. It permits termination of pregnancy even up to 24 weeks and a termination without any limit on age if, for instance, the child is suffering from a deformity. Now, in this case, the young girl didn't realize that she had missed, that she had missed her periods because she was suffering from irregular periods. So, by the time she realized that she was pregnant, she was already 24 or 25 weeks pregnant. The Bombay High Court came to the conclusion that she had crossed the maximum permissible under the Act, which was 24 weeks and dismissed her petition. By the time she came to the Supreme Court, she was about 29 or 30 weeks pregnant. Our constitutional courts, particularly the Supreme Court, have the power under Article 142 of the Constitution to do complete justice. We asked the government hospital to give us a report on what would be the effect of a delivery of childbirth on the physical and emotional and mental framework of this young girl who was before us. And they came back with a verdict, a report telling us that the child will suffer extreme trauma if she were to give birth after about four or five weeks. So we directed a medical termination of pregnancy, uh, authorizing the doctors at Sion Hospital in Mumbai to carry out the termination, even though she had crossed the maximum limit under the Act. But that was not the end of the story. There was still a sting in the tail. One week after we passed the order, we got a report from the doctors saying that there were three contrary statements by the parents. In the first statement, the mother said that I want to allow my child and my child is depending on me to go ahead with a full term delivery, which will then give the child an adoption. In the second statement, the parents said, no, we want a termination of pregnancy. In a third statement, they took a contrary position. Our doctors came back to us with a report saying, what do we do, judges? Do we terminate or do we not terminate? The trouble was by then she was approaching her 31st week of pregnancy and she was bearing a full term baby. 
we went back to the doctors. We held a video conferencing session with the parents and the doctors just four or five days back. This time the doctors said that if we have to terminate the pregnancy at this stage, we can do it. There are government guidelines. But we have to administer a chemical, an injection called KCL intravenously. It's an intracardiac injection which we have to administer to the baby's cardiac uh, position and then basically the cardiac, the cardiac function of the baby is stopped. But they said that if that doesn't happen in the first injection, we'll have to repeat the procedure after a sonography and then go on repeating it until we can certify that the baby's cardiac function has stopped. Difficult for us as judges on what to do. So what we did was we said to the doctors, what is your assessment? The doctors told us that, well, at this point of time, we cannot assure you that this child is going to be safe in the course of this procedure because what happens if KCL uh, results into a leakage into her respiratory system or into her system? There's a danger that the child's life may be in danger. And the mother turned to us and said, She wanted to save the child. So very... Uh, in, in a way with a very heavy heart we had to recall our order and said well the child will now at this stage with 31 or 32 weeks have to go through with a full term of pregnancy and then we directed the government that you shall now provide all treatment free of cost that the government will facilitate a child adoption if she would like to give the child an adoption so on and so forth so this tells you how complex some of these issues are we're not just dealing with only juveniles in conflict with law a child who is alleged to have been raped by an uncle within the family, a child sexual abuse act within the family, not reported. These are so familiar to all of us. These are not. These are real life problems which we as judges have to confront. A critical challenge in the effective implementation of juvenile justice laws is the insufficient, insufficient infrastructure and resources, especially in rural regions. The Honorable Minister made such an impassioned plea uh, Ms. Bhagwati Chaudhary and it was so familiar uh, something that ma'am spoke about so frankly and with so much of candor an illustration of the challenges stemming from inadequate infrastructure in juvenile justice can be found in a memoir called Angela's Ashes through the lens of his family's struggles in Limerick, Ireland Irish author Frank McCourt exposes how the absence of essential resources and support systems can drive vulnerable youth towards delinquency. His portrayal of his brother and his descent into a cycle of petty crime vividly demonstrates how systemic neglect perpetuates the marginalization and disenfranchisement of youth in impoverished settings, leaving them without proper guidance or alternatives for their future. In modern contexts, Insufficient infrastructure and resources pose significant obstacles to the effective implementation of juvenile justice laws, particularly in rural areas. Inadequate juvenile detention centers or rehabilitation homes may lead to overcrowding and substandard living conditions, hindering efforts to provide proper support and rehabilitation to juvenile offenders. Limited access to essential services such as counseling, education or vocational training complicates the successful reintegration of juveniles into society. The implementation of juvenile justice laws needs to take social realities into account. A study titled Rights of Children, a case study of child beggars at public places in India, highlighted the alarming reality that approximately 44,000 children are ensnared by criminal gangs every year. These children are coerced into engaging in begging, trafficking, smuggling, and other criminal activities. The implementation of juvenile justice law should also consider the unique challenges faced by juveniles with disabilities. For instance, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, in its 2000 report, 2020 report, documented the exploitation of visually impaired children in India who were coerced into begging by criminal syndicates exploiting both their disability and socio-economic circumstances. In light of such realities, it becomes imperative for juvenile justice systems to adopt tailored approaches that, uh, that address the specific needs and vulnerabilities of these marginalized groups, ensuring their protection and rehabilitation. At the same time, 
the changing nature of crimes, particularly with the increasing prevalence of digital crime, poses new challenges for juvenile justice systems globally. Recent data from the National Crime Records Bureau in India, unveiled last month, paints a concerning picture regarding cybercrime. In 2022, the reported number of cases surged from 345 to 685 compared to 2021, nearly doubling within a year. With technology evolving rapidly, juveniles are diving into cyber crimes like hacking, cyberbullying, online fraud, and digital harassment. The anonymity and accessibility of digital platforms lowers barriers to entry, luring young individuals into illicit activities. For instance, I like to take the example of the Momo Challenge 2019, a viral hoax that spread through social media platforms targeting children and adolescents. This hoax purported a series of escalating dares, including self-harm or suicide, although it was later debunked. Its rapid dissemination highlighted the susceptibility of juveniles to online dangers. There is a need for proactive measures to educate and safeguard young individuals in the digital age, emphasizing digital literacy, responsible online behavior, and effective parental guidance as crucial components in mitigating cyber-related risks. And finally, capacity building. Juvenile justice systems must thus adapt by enhancing international cooperation mechanisms and sharing best practices to address the transnational nature of digital crimes involving juveniles. This includes establishing protocols for extradition and repatriation, as well as facilitating information sharing and cooperation between law enforcement agencies. At the domestic level, specific training in child protection rules is essential to ensure that all stakeholders involved in the juvenile justice system have the necessary knowledge and skills to safeguard the rights and well-being of children. This training should encompass various aspects of child protection, including understanding child development, recognizing signs of abuse or neglect, and familiarizing oneself with relevant laws and procedures. Training programs should incorporate principles of trauma-informed care, emphasizing sensitivity and empathy towards juvenile offenders who may have experienced adverse consequences. Let me then, in conclusion, wrap up by saying that for a lot of our societies in the Global South, which only remind us that good laws do not necessarily result in good implementation. We have amazing laws. We have some forward-looking legislation. The Children Act in Nepal, the Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act in India, these are clear legislative instruments which are in keeping with the best standards internationally. But then there is this gap between the law and the implementation of the law. And that's where we as judges and courts step in. I can only share with you just two or three models which we are following in the Supreme Court of India. Sometimes we provide for direct supervision by us of the stage of the implementation of the law by calling for regular reports from local governments, from state governments, from municipal authorities. But we have also now adopted a different model for supervision. India is such a vast country Imagine the judge of the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice of India, sitting across and finding out how many child welfare committees have been established in different parts of the country. Just not feasible physically. Then how do we do it? Now, we have adopted two alternative approaches in India, which we are experimenting with. One approach is that we have been asking for a public disclosure of information. Because we believe that disclosure of information in itself is a very valid way to ensure good implementation of the law. Because once you disclose information about the implementation of the law, local authorities get sensitized that now my implementation of the law is going to be on a public platform. So we have been engaging, for instance, the Union Ministry of Women and Child Development or the Department of Empowerment of Persons of Disabilities in the Ministry of, child, in the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment to prepare a dashboard and that dashboard gives online, real-time information. We have, for instance, the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act 
2016. We have a case, for instance, of halfway homes. I'm sure the same thing exists in both our societies. This is not a criticism, but just a realistic assessment because we know that these are the true facts on the ground. We have what are called these mental health institutions in India, where people who suffer from mental health issues are housed. So very often, people after they are cured of mental health issues still continue to remain in those homes. Likewise, you find that child offenders continue to remain in the institutions even after they have ceased to be children. Why? There is nowhere to go to. The families don't want to take these people who have been cured of mental illnesses, so they just continue to remain in the mental health institutions. The doctors are just kind; they allow them to work as gardeners, as as peons, as you know, as as support staff. So we have directed the government of India to create halfway homes, the point when they leave mental health institutions and until their reintegration into society. Now, how do you ensure? that every district in india or every couple of districts do have a halfway home so these dashboards for information have been our source of information it helps the community the community knows that there exist such institutions plus we have real time information as decision makers at a policy making level last example which i want to give and please forgive me for having overshot my time i'll just do that in 2 minutes and i'll be done we had a case when i was a judge of the bombay high court where there were children who were lodged in a home for young offenders and these children were not merely minors but these were also disabled children children who were differently abled now they were lodged in a private home a newspaper report came out with a story that many of these young girls had been sexually abused we took up the matter in the exercise of our suo moto jurisdiction and we started monitoring the matter we first and foremost appointed a very sensitive woman investigating officer and she would come back and report to us on what she had to do to get these children to speak because the children were so deeply traumatized by the sexual abuse that they had faced so she would go to the home she would play with them she would paint with them she would sing with them and that's how she learned to draw these children out and that's when they started disclosing the nature of the crime we had to ensure that the children were distanced from those who were in charge of the home they were put under arrest but we had to ensure the safety of the children because they were the prime witnesses in the criminal trial having done that we realized that though the children were differently able they suffered from different degrees of disability too very often we treat all children in conflict of law as if they are all juveniles but their degree of juvenility and the degree of offense is very different likewise when you have young children who are mentally challenged or physically challenged the degree of disability varies so the next stage that we did was to have tailor made plans which is very crucial and i thought i'll share this example before i conclude because when we dispense justice it is very important that we dispense individually tailor made justice and not justice with one brush the danger in our courts is that we dispense justice with one brush because we want to show we are even handed but when we deal with young children you have to dispense tailor made justice so we dispense tailor made justice by devising individual plans depending upon the nature of the disability of the child and we got the tata institute of social sciences a distinguished professor by the name of dr asha bajpai who was assisting us as a mic curator who helped us contact schools those schools prepared tailor made plans for the rehabilitation of the children some child could only sing some child was good at math some child could do something else but then we prepared these tailor made plans so that we tried to give these children a a more than even chance at the future and very recently i met the good professor professor asha bajpai who told me she said you'd be very delighted to know that one of those children one of those children who we prepared that tailor made plan for is now a manager in a five star hotel in mumbai so you know these are so these are just uh, some of the challenges which we face as judges uh, some of the uh, problems which we face but at the end of it all you know the real i think the real fulfillment in the work which we do as judges and as, uh, as as officers of the law as servants of the law which we are 
is this engagement with our community because we realize the limitations. We are not one of those societies where, you know, resources are unlimited. We have to work our way within our systems. We have wonderful people who are willing to go beyond the call of duty, help children in conflict of law. We realize that there are limitations of infrastructure, but we have to push the, the envelope along. Uh, keep on telling local authorities, come on now, tell us how many more child welfare committees have you installed? How much more have you done in terms of the implementation of the law? So this is a continuing process of uh, our own engagement with uh, the rule of law to make sure that our, uh, our societies become more livable and that we can transform the lives in the context of today's seminar for the future of our, of our nations. I'll conclude by once again uh, thanking UNICEF, the Supreme Court of Nepal and everyone who's organized this conference for inviting me here and allowing me this extended uh, duration to share some of my experiences. Thank you very much.